the doorbell, an innocuous object, a simple mechanism of call and response. It rings, the door is answered. Yet what lies beyond the threshold can transform the mundane into the macabre. I, David, am a humble house painter by trade. I often find myself working alongside Joe, a man of few words, middle-aged, a Christian of unwavering faith. It's a peculiar twist of fate that his devout beliefs would play a role in the uncanny events of that fateful Wednesday afternoon. We found ourselves laboring in a house, its walls cracked with age, dust clinging to every surface, and an eerie ability to cast shadows in rooms bathed in sunlight. The house was home to two women, sisters, I presumed. They moved in a synchronized ballet, their movements mirroring each other, reminiscent of the elderly woman in the film Don't Look Now, a film that masterfully employed suspense, though its lack of action eventually rendered it mundane. I apologize for my digression. I have a tendency to let my mind wander as I work, and documenting the day's events seems to amplify my verbosity. The sisters had left the house for several hours, their destination unknown. Judging by the empty lorazepam bottles and their obsessive discussions about death on the news, I surmised their departure was an escape from the oppressive loneliness and depression that permeates the Philadelphia suburbs. So, it was just Joe, myself, and a dying radio belting out oldies. The radio, in an odd twist, would turn to static whenever I walked by, only me. I mused about possibly being a demon, the kind of thoughts that occupy your mind when you're driving the 400th screw into gypsum. Spiral into gypsum, I thought. That would make a decent band name. I digress again. My mind is a runaway train of thought. The doorbell rang, its chime echoing through the house. Joe from the other room called out, Hey Dave, can you get that? My hands are full. I questioned the wisdom of answering the door in the homeowner's absence. Well, no, Joe conceded. Whoever it is can always come back later. Silence filled the room. Um, come help me dry fit this, Joe said, knowing I'd soon be holding my arms above my head for longer than I'd like. An hour passed, the women hadn't returned, and we had exhausted our drywall supply upstairs. Joe tasked me with fetching another sheet from downstairs. The prospect of maneuvering a cumbersome piece of sheetrock wasn't particularly appealing, but the sooner we finished, the sooner I could indulge in the ice cream waiting for me in my freezer. I'm essentially a child at heart, sue me. As I descended the stairs, I halted. The front door, veiled by a thin curtain, was backlit by sunlight, casting a silhouette on the other side. I raised an eyebrow in confusion, as if anyone could see my perplexed expression. The figure standing there was eerily still, so I assumed it was one of the women returning. It's fascinating how we instinctively rationalize the inexplicable. We don't necessarily make sense of the world, but rather, we construct our own reality where nothing malevolent can occur. I reached out, my hand gripping the tarnished handle, and pulled the door open. Standing before me was a man clad in a black suit a suit that seemed to have been plucked from a time two centuries prior. He wore a bowler hat, his visage vaguely reminiscent of an elderly Sinatra. His voice, however, was far from the chairman's. It was deep, leaving a bitter taste in my mouth. Hello, friend, he greeted, his voice echoing in the silent hallway. I was beginning to think you would never answer the door. At this point, I should have slammed the door shut, but I was paralyzed a deer caught in the headlights of the oncoming events. Um, I didn't know you were there this whole time. Are you a friend of Maureen's? I asked, trying to make sense of the situation. He had to know the homeowner, right? Oh no, he replied, pulling out reading glasses from his pocket. I'm just here to deliver an envelope to a Joe house. Is that what that says? Yes, Joe house, I confirmed. Do you happen to be Joe? No, I'm not Joe, but I could take this to him if you'd like. He's right upstairs. No, he refused. I can't allow you to touch the envelope. But if you would allow me to come in, I'd be more than happy to deliver the message and to be on my way. I heard footsteps behind me. Joe had finally grown impatient. Dave, where's the drywall? Who's that? He asked, his voice echoing in the empty hallway. It's not important, but this envelope is for Joe House. Would you be Joe House? The old man's demeanor was exceedingly pleasant, his smile devoid of malice. I am, Joe replied, approaching the man with caution. 
he snatched the off-white envelope, opening it at arm's length. If this is anthrax, I'm making sure that you die with me, old man. Joe was a conspiracy theorist, always expecting the worst. The man chuckled. It's nothing of the sort, but I appreciate the humor. Joe removed a single piece of paper from the envelope, reading it aloud with a grimace. It isn't solar storms. It isn't demons. It isn't nuclear. He paused, looking up at the man. Then what the heck is it? No, the man replied. I just deliver the messages. With a stiff wave, he collapsed into a heap on the porch. The police arrived promptly, their sirens piercing the quiet afternoon. They took statements from each of us, surveyed the area, and tried to make sense of the situation. The homeowners finally returned, horrified to find an old man dead on their porch. The man was a complete stranger to everyone, carrying nothing in his pockets, no tags in his clothing, no fingerprints. His teeth were dentures, unmarked and untraceable. The officers, unsure of what to do, told us to call them if anything else happened, and then they were gone. Maureen's sister had gone upstairs to lie down. Joe, Maureen, and I made awkward small talk, trying to forget the old man and the envelope. Joe made no mention of the envelope to the police or to the sisters. We decided to continue working, a decision we would soon regret. I was working in the front bedroom when I pushed the door open. There was Maureen's sister, Diona, lying dead on the floor her eyes wide open, her chest and stomach sliced open, revealing a bloodless cavity. Her arm was propped up with a wooden board, pointing directly at the ceiling. One of the pieces of drywall had a new arrangement of nail holes, forming a pentagram. It appeared to be bleeding red fluid, dripping from the old nail holes. My heart was racing, but until you've seen something atrocious, you don't know how you would react. Maureen vomited before passing out on the floor. I stood frozen, my heart pounding in my chest, my hands ringing in anxiety. The vice grip in my chest signaled a panic attack. What do I do now? What did this? And then Joe opened the last envelope. This one was completely black, buried beneath the others. Unlike the previous letters, this was opened with care. The vigor was gone. Joe stood still for a while before returning to look out the window. Where I was situated at the door, I couldn't see what he was looking at, but I didn't need to see it. Get the heck out of here now. Joe turned to me in a frenzy, running towards the door as I heard a shattering glass. I glanced back as I flew down the stairs, only to see Joe recline on the hardwood floor, nails tearing off into cascading rad. He was being dragged by a scabbed hand with long and yellowy nails. I didn't see what the hand belonged to, but it didn't matter. I thought of going back to save Maureen, but as I plowed through the front door, her body exploded from the window above me. The sound of bones cracking and ripping accompanied the unnatural bounce of her body. Run, little rabbit, it's hunting season. A monotonous tone, a sour taste in my mouth. The taste of garbage and hate, not my own hate. I threw open my car door, remembering suddenly that my battery had been temperamental lately. One turn of the key, grinding sounds. Two turns of the key, grinding sounds. Three turns of the key, no sounds. I looked up at the second floor window, feeling eyes on me. Being parked across the street, the view of the window was clear enough to make out an abnormally large head, given that appearance by a mass of matted, straw-like black hair. The hair obscured all facial features except the scarred, dirty cheeks and jaw, adorned with, well, it wasn't a smile. The mouth was open and displaying gritted caramel teeth. The expression didn't indicate any emotion. Four turns. The window gazer had slithered from the window, limbs being used in the wrong way to exit onto the overhang above the front door. Five turns. The window gazer reached a scabbed hand onto the drain pipe, attempting to slide down the pipe upside down. The nails and brackets in the loop tore flesh from the thing, dripping red onto the pavement in a sinister shower. Six turns. The thing lay still on the ground for several seconds before wildly flailing its bony body parts, the whole time seemingly training that eyeless gaze on me. Mouth still open, teeth still gritted, blood still leaking from fresh wounds. Seven turns. Lucky seven. The car came to life, turning the corner and I was gone. Right into traffic. Crap, crap, crap. Cars in front, cars behind. 
I glanced behind me, expecting to see the beast wandering towards the main road, but instead I saw Maureen and Diana pull their car around the block. My phone buzzed. It was Joe. Hello? Where the heck are you, man? I... You're okay? What the heck are you talking about? You ran to your car all panicky. I'm concerned for you. I pulled the car to the side of the road, staring at my hands for no reason other than that they existed. The phone was still on, and Joe asked if I was there, but I couldn't bring myself to answer. Was it really Joe? I decided to ask him one thing. What did it say in the last envelope? There was a moment of static, then a sour taste filled my mouth. I knew I wasn't going back to that house. It's curiosity. I sat there, my heart pounding in my chest, my hands trembling on the steering wheel. The world around me seemed to blur, the sounds of the city fading into a distant hum. I was alone, trapped in my own thoughts, my own fears. The taste of fear was bitter in my mouth, a stark reminder of the horror I had just escaped. I thought back to the house, to the strange man in the black suit, to the cryptic messages in the envelopes. It all seemed so surreal, like a nightmare that I couldn't wake up from. But the taste in my mouth, the pounding of my heart, the tremor in my hands, they were all too real. I thought about Joe, about Maureen and Diana. Were they okay? Were they still trapped in that house of horrors? I wanted to go back, to help them, but fear held me back. The memory of the beast, of its grotesque form and its chilling gaze, was still fresh in my mind. I couldn't go back. I couldn't face that horror again. I started the car again, the engine roaring to life. I drove away, leaving the house and its horrors behind. But as I drove, I couldn't shake off the feeling of dread that clung to me. The taste in my mouth, the pounding of my heart, the tremor in my hands. They were all constant reminders of the horror I had escaped. As I drove, I found myself thinking about the last message in the envelope. Its curiosity. What did it mean? Was it a warning? A threat? Or was it simply a statement of fact? I didn't know, and I didn't want to know. All I wanted was to get as far away from that house as possible. But as I drove, I couldn't help but glance in the rearview mirror, half expecting to see the beast following me. But all I saw was the city, its buildings and streets bathed in the fading light of the setting sun. The house, the beast, the horror, they were all behind me. But the taste in my mouth, the pounding of my heart, the tremor in my hands, they were all reminders of the horror I had escaped. And so, I drove on, leaving the house and its horrors behind. But as I drove, I couldn't shake off the feeling of dread that clung to me. The taste in my mouth, the pounding of my heart, the tremor in my hands, they were all constant reminders of the horror I had escaped. And as I drove, I couldn't help but wonder, what was it that had caused such horror? What was it that had turned a simple house painting job into a nightmare of unimaginable horror? As I drove, I found myself thinking about the last message in the envelope. Its curiosity. What did it mean? Was it a warning? A threat? Or was it simply a statement of fact? I didn't know, and I didn't want to know. All I knew was that I had escaped, that I was alive. And for now, that was enough. 